this morning. I just simply could not do that to anyone. And truthfully, I could not think of one person, and that even includes Allison Vance with that brilliant, lovely Scottish accent who could make this reading seem less awkward or troublesome. Now, top it off, what a great passage for Father's Day. Imagine with me a Father's Day Hallmark greeting card, and when you open it up, it reads, For I have come to set a man against his father. Whoever loves father or mother than me is not worthy of me. Greatest dad ever, love you. Now, truthfully, the text reminds me of a rallying cry from the great Uthred Ragnarsson of Blast Kingdom. Standing before the masses prepared for battle, reciting the words while the drumming begins. Do not think I have come to bring peace I have not come to bring peace but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father and his daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. These are tough, tough verses, chilling words, so unlike the Christ we know, and yet they are recorded here in the Gospel of, of Matthew, included as part of the lectionary reading. And for some reason, folks determine that the passage would be helpful for us as Christians, as disciples of Christ. Now, if we were able to highlight and lift these verses out of Matthew, do a standalone cut and paste and dismiss whatever came before and whatever comes after, I'll suggest that the, that the, the verses sound bizarre and really have no relevancy. But I can boldly declare that they would not reflect the message or image of Jesus. And for those who lean toward textualism, these verses become very problematic. You cannot superimpose a literal interpretation. And to poke at you a bit, if you want to make a literal interpretation of these passages, these words, why do you not want to do the same with other passages in the scripture, like sell all that you have and give the money to the poor, then come and follow me? So either when we either superimpose or when we eisegete, which is interpreting the text in such a way as to introduce one's own presuppositions or agendas or biases, what we commonly refer to as reading into the text. If we literally read this, or if we put our own stuff into the text, we're gonna miss out on the richness and depth of what is being revealed, and there is relevancy in this passage. We just have to work to understand the context and the content. Now, before we get going, I just want everybody to take a big, deep breath, take a sip of coffee or tea, breathe in and out, and just relax, because these words don't really mean what they say. You don't have to be against your father or mother. And whatever it says, you don't have to turn against your family to follow Jesus. Our work at understanding the context and the content begins by understanding that the passage is referred to as, a, as part of the missionary discourse in Matthew. Actually, it's the second of five sections recorded in Matthew and taken as a whole, which means all five sections, it is about discipleship, and particularly, this section addresses the issue of the reaction that the disciples might encounter as they carry out their mission and the principles of discipleship. This section sets out a, a, a series of instructions that Jesus gives his disciples as he sends them out 
for a particular mission at a unique moment in history, a unique moment in his Galilean ministry. And this section is entirely focused on how to be disciples in the context of their current situation. Jesus is actually addressing the faithful who are trying to live faithfully in the face of conflict, discouragement, and even threats to their being. All because they have chosen to share gospel, to share the good news. So everything we hear and we read in this section has to be interpreted through the lens of discipleship. The harshness of the words, the controversial sayings, everything needs to be heard as a disciple living around 70 AD, 40 years after Jesus' resurrection. And it's not so much where discipleship will take them in the future as much as it is what does discipleship mean for them today in their current situation. So what we read is the, the author is uh, uh, framing a progressively forbidding picture of discipleship. All the sexiness of being a follower of Jesus has, has run its course, and the message seeks to encourage his followers to face in the face of persecution and martyrdom. Those who choose to follow Jesus are criticized, they're betrayed, they're forced, to carry their own cross. And that's the context. The landscape for the disciples is threatening. And at whatever the cost, disciples need to be obedient to their calling. And these, this section in Matthew helps define how to be obedient. They need to embody what they had heard and seen and received in Jesus. Now, it's been said that throughout the, this passage, obedience implies responsibility. And a disciple of Jesus is one who first listens closely to the teachings of Jesus and then decides on appropriate responses. This, res this response, their response, is found in a discipleship that summons disciples to develop the capacity of learning and growing in faith. So there are no predetermined or routine preconceptions of, of the situation or the will of God. It's just not appropriate. Jesus requires an, a discerning obedience, which is to accept responsibility for the good of God's creatures God's community and God's creation. So remember, it's not so much about where discipleship will take them or where it takes us as much as about what discipleship means in the living of these days. Now we know that the landscape in which we find ourselves is so far removed from the, the context of the disciples in Matthew's gospel. It's the summer of 2020 in Sarasota, Florida. We're not threatened because of our faith in Jesus. Nobody is after us because we're believers. <clears throat> we're not persecuted. And there is absolutely no worry about any one of us being martyred. And yet, is not our call to discipleship significant as well? Are we not also vital in responding to God's will in our time? I want us to think for a few moments about what a discerning obedience looks like for us today. And to discern means to, to separate, to distinguish. In the Greek, Discern comes from the word diachrisis, which is to test or to distinguish good and evil. Discernment is to see to 
the heart of the matter with spiritual eyes or from God's vantage point. Think about that for a moment. Discernment is to see to the heart of the matter with spiritual eyes or to see from God's vantage point. How does God look at things we look at? What does God see in the things that we see? Discerning obedience is the practice by which we seek to recognize and intentionally take part in the activity of God in concrete actions, in those concrete ways, in the situations we find ourselves. So a, a discerning obedience involves listening, seeing, recognizing and doing God's will. They are the four imperatives. They are the actions of the, of, a, of the embodiment of a discerning obedience. Listening, seeing, recognizing, and doing. And that's what Jesus is requiring from discipleship, a discerning obedience to accept the responsibility for the good of God's creatures, community, and creation. So what does a discerning obedience look like as we continue to face the impacts and the spread of the COVID virus? What are we hearing, seeing, recognizing, and doing for the well of God, for the well-being of God's creatures community and cre creation. What, are we, what, does a, what does a discerning obedience look like as we witness the ongoing civil upheaval and protest across our land due to racial inequality and injustice? What are we hearing and seeing and recognizing and doing for the well-being of God's creatures, community, and creation? What does a, a discerning obedience look like as we observe the financial markets trending upwards, creating greater wealth for some, while 38.6 million people are unemployed? What are we seeing and hearing and recognizing and doing for the well-being of God's creatures, community, and creation? And what does a discerning obedience look like as we experience the negative impacts of global warming while we conveniently ignore scientific data which alerts of a near future in distress? What are we hearing and seeing and recognizing and doing for the good of God's creatures and community and creation? A discerning obedience leads to creating responsibility we have a duty to act. It is rooted in our beliefs. It is in the DNA of our Savior. Taking responsibility, creating actions for the good. That's who we are. And like those early disciples who Matthew's address, we too need to embody what we have heard and seen and learned in our Savior. Christ-like living, embodying kingdom life, engaging in discipleship, call it whatever you like, but making Jesus a priority will always create tension. It puts stress on our relationships within our families, between friends. Living Christ-like may be an excellent way to, to live, but it will cause problems. There'll be misunderstanding. Labels will be shouted out loud, generalizations made. There will be dismissal and rejection, all because you have chosen to embody what you have heard, seen, and received in Jesus. So the text is not off base. If any one of us chooses to make discipleship a higher priority, 
if any one of us choose to make discipleship our highest priority, then we will be at odds with those who have made a different choice. So we invite you. We invite you to reflect on what a discerning obedience looks like for you in this time and in this place, in the living of your days. And we invite you to remember what you have heard, seen, and received in Jesus, our Savior. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for your word. We ask that you now bring upon us in our hearts and heads, in our being, your Holy Spirit to do its work for us so we can do good for your creatures, community, and creation. For we do pray in Christ our Lord. Amen.